is that he has a context. Right, so if you look at literature and try to even define semantics, what is uh, semantics? Right? Have you, do you know what is semantics? Or do you know, do you have a definition of semantics? Uh, have you read it? Yeah, you're, I think you put it in the... Uh, I put it in, yes. Yeah. But you will see uh, elsewhere, there be, I, that definition is not necessarily what everybody else uses. You, you will see millions of, um, or not millions, but uh, hundreds of presentational semantics and semantic web. Where, what, what definition have they given? Some meaning about the data, uh, and uh, normal. Uh, usually, we use some tags uh, to show this semantics. So, where is the meaning? Mm. Where do you get the meaning? Maybe it, it's uh, actually more visible through the relationship. Is the meaning? It's that is implicit. Um, that is um, a mechanism we understand and we have that indeed plays a very important role. So indeed, uh, relationship plays extremely uh, important role in uh, as ascribing meaning. But what it is? What translates data into knowledge? Uh, I think it always depends on the query you give. Like let us say, if you give some uh, query as cat, then we look for cat in that text. If you give some other like uh, some pickup or something, so, like, I think it depends on the query we give, right? Okay. Um, so, do, do you think, mean it's okay? We'll, why don't you guys do some reading, and we'll discuss in the next class. I will. I will right now simply say the following, uh, just to move along uh, here, in that the way I define um, semantics is meaning and use of data. The example of video surveillance I gave. Use, there I'm giving the semantics as in the use, being able to find the person who you did not know, who could be a suspect. Right? And Hussein made a very important point. He seems to have clearly read some of the literature well. Relationship plays a very important role in the following sense that essentially at the core of any representation, Remember, I made a very fundamental uh, uh, observation last time that you have a variety of ways you represent data, data structures basically, right? You have um, a list, yeah. you have tree, mm -hmm. you have graph, mm -hmm. you have bag of words, right? A very fundamental thing that any programming language is, uh, any, any high level programming language would have, right? The riches of that is graph. And a graph has a node and edge. A graph is made up of nodes and edges. Very important observation is that the nodes by themselves are, are not sufficient to capture meaning. Because all nodes have is label. Then how do you interpret that label? Right? I, I have seen this node and you will mark this label and somebody else will mark this label. Who is right? So the only other mechanism we have where I can even argue that this labeling is doing something more than some word or some text or some string is that I am I'm connecting this to that. Collectively now, I'm th that fixes. This thing is connected to that really constrains the interpretation you can associate with this label, this node. So I uh, said uh, in 2003, I gave a keynote relationship at the heart of semantics and semantic web. In, there is no semantics without really uh, talking about relationships. The, there is another very important thing that we will discuss a little bit later on with regards to semantics is that a relationship beyond relationship there needs to be something where there is some sort of agreement to have a common interpretation. Because I, let's say I you use natural language, I use some words. What, how do you know that those words mean the same thing to you as it, they may, meant to me? Right? And this is where there is some commitment to both of us. One simple way would be to say, 
Look, both of us subscribe to dictionary definition. There are different definitions, there are some nuances, but most of the time there is a uh, you know same definition about there is the you know about that word in the dictionary. Implicitly, you and I subscribe to the same definition of the words that I'm speaking, and this is why my words are meaningful to you. Yeah, and that's how ontology comes into the picture. Oh yes. So the, the, isn't this like the the efforts of schema to talk to actually agree upon some like the definitions and how you actually define things, right? That is a uh, schema.org is a limited uh, effort, uh, is an effort uh, that has a limited purpose, but in that purpose, indeed, that is exactly what it is. That's why schema.org today is one of the most significant, if not the most significant effort uh, to utilize semantics. So there are many, many forms we will see in this course that we, we, we will realize semantics, many forms. There will be formal ontology, there will be bag of words, there will be some common vocabulary, nomenclature, there's schema.org, there's namespace in any you know, web system, there is URID referencing. All these ways which you will do for ontological alignment, let's say, conceptual alignment. These are all various forms, tools that we would utilize to support semantics. All attempting to have common meaning mm. between the users of that data. Between the, you, uh, those users who, mean that may include humans or applications that interpret that data. Coming back to the original uh, uh, point here, data by itself doesn't have to imply semantics. Mm -hmm. It comes in terms of our attempt to have shared interpretation, uh, uh, aka meaning, or a, a use, which ultimately again is going to be consumed by humans or dis in decision making and whatnot. <coughs> But there is a problem like what, what Norweg is saying about in his article that... We'll come to that later on, so hold on to that. That we are going to come explicitly and discuss in detail, right? So um, very quickly, um, uh, we, we, in the last class we say, uh, kind of noticed that um, there are a number of um, forces that are coming out, number of tools, number of technologies, where semantics is playing a critical role. Even though, at least at this time, semantic technologies, are, uh, they are not as prevalent as others, other things like information retrieval, machine learning, uh, NLP, these are, these are more widely used, quote unquote, you know, technologies and techniques compared to semantic web. But it is semantic technologies uh, is clearly uh, a, a, in ascendancy. And I uh, reviewed um, some of the activities that have happened, including in this particular case uh, where there was a business uh, decision mm -hmm. which uh, uh, valued semantics. Mm. The fact that each of these things happened, you know, PowerSet, uh, Siri as a company before Apple, mm -hmm. Apple purchased it, MetaWeb as a mm -hmm. uh, creator of Freebase, Freebase itself, mm -hmm. the, you know, going for a more or richer representation which is better at capturing semantics because now you have relationship in this graph. Mm -hmm. Annotations, again you are, uh, we'll see semantic annotations later on. These are all the things that are happening, activities that are happening um, which where semantics was playing a role and somebody attached commercial value to it. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to note that. And, okay. And then uh, I mentioned schema.org, but we'll be coming to this uh, later on. I uh, mentioned here knowledge graph. Again, we'll talk about that at a lot more length. But if you're talking about search, which is um, probably the, is, is a, I would say search is the biggest uh, internet application, right? Uh, email is one, and search. These are the two. There's nothing um, more. Uh, I don't know whether we do more search or more consumer e uh, more uh, emails. It will vary. Um, so, in that particular context, scheme uh, now semantics has started to be used, which is very important. 
in there um, both the knowledge graph and schema.org are playing extremely important role and all this is happening in the last three four five years right now here um, I like unless somebody has um, observed or somebody wants to make a comment um, how does say Google's use of knowledge graph mm -hmm. and Google's use of schema.org attempt to bring in semantics from different in, of different forms from different sources for different purpose does has anybody observed that anybody wants to make comment on that yeah I mean that's the custom box hmm? that's the custom box when no no that is a use that, I'm not talking about that I'm talking about something semantics is captured by schema.org and something else is captured by knowledge graph. Both are used yeah. and extensively. Well, well, I guess there are like normally like or mainly there are two different kinds of where I get at the actual the data. First of all is the atomized which we have to agree upon which how do we actually understand the data from the tags from the, the like those things the other thing is using the force the human created yeah creators like to actually build the knowledge and this is what i what you said in the last uh, lecture that freebase actually did that using the uh, human force to build the knowledge but now knowledge graph is not limited at all to the uh, human credit content. It, they started with that and now they have an extensive amount of uh, uh, semi-automatic and uh, automated techniques and in fact they have uh, uh, you know just to indicate that they have something different um, they they have a new word a new term called knowledge vault mm -hmm. so the knowledge vault uh, yeah, is claimed is all sources, done right? automatically oh yeah the trusted sources you mean oh that's how we did it in, in, in 15 years ago yeah but uh, in Tali, you know, and Symagix, that's how we did it. But um, in Google's current, you know, effort in knowledge vault, and IBM is, sorry, my, uh, 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 Microsoft has another major effort in creating large knowledge source, and so many others have it. So, and I, you know, IBM itself has a knowledge graph, one of our students who did internship, uh, uh, you know, uh, had, uh, had a preview of that. So, so the point here is that, um, uh, okay, the point here is just, I'll put in a, uh, a little bit of distinction and then you guys need to reflect more. But essentially in schema, uh, uh, or what happens is that uh, a body, a community, um, a limited number of people, Ramnath Guha from Google and XYZ from Microsoft and yeah, some, some ABC from Yahoo, they come together, there's a committee, and they uh, create a schema description. And then what happens? Anybody who wants his or her web page or web resource to be annotated will do the annotation, you know, would tag with respect to that schema. So what's happening here? Human human content creator, creator of a web page or whatever, that, you know, oh, okay. is powering the semantics, is in fact giving, uh, you know, doing the annotations and tagging. While on the knowledge graph, the companies are doing themselves, not content developer, is developed se separately. So, suppose knowledge graph, let's say one way of creating knowledge graph is to use Wikipedia. And suppose there is a Wikipedia page on Tim Berners-Lee or me or whosoever there is, uh, on 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 uh, you know Jeff uh, uh, Sachs or uh, whatever, right? All these uh, then or Obama. Then um, the knowledge graph creation from Wikipedia is utilizing the work that somebody else has done to create its knowledge graph. But, but the content creator is not directly giving to Knowledge Graph what he or she is doing. That is a new difference. 
There's more, but that's right. You see this? Okay. So uh, I want uh, I, I want I, I discuss this. Let me kind of rehash a little bit here. Now I must admit that this is a lot more valuable to my PhD students than um, just about everybody. But um, let me uh, review a bit of my personal um, history, uh, my own run into semantics, right? And um, if you look at my blog item, which we are going to discuss shortly, I mentioned my my first um, exposure or my first uh, use of semantics. What was that? Uh, well, you're teaching heterogeneous distributed databases. Absolutely. So, so what was the example I gave? Do you remember? Yeah, your your experience in when you when you're having pizza. Uh, yes. Which one? Mm -hmm. Cosmos. It was ordered as three. So I was. Um, this was before EU, uh, before Euro was uh, adopted. So I was uh, in 1988 uh, uh, visiting Venice, Italy, and. Um, uh, I was in a budget and uh, didn't want to spend much for um, uh, my meal and um, there was this restaurant that had uh, enterprise a pizza for 3,000 lira which was 1,000 lira was one dollar at that time so about three dollars which is I said that's I can afford that when I got so I ordered that pizza and I got the bill of 8,500 and so now that that gave me the in, in point was that oh the menu cost of uh, you know pizza is three thousand but then there are two service charges or one service charge and two taxes whatever that is there were three additional charges or between you know service charge and taxes and that's how they came up with um, eight thousand five hundred right so what is it what is the cost of the meal is it three thousand or eight thousand five hundred yes and this is where the you know concept of semantics comes or meaning what does it mean right what meal cost what does it mean is it the value item or is it the customer what customer pays and that is has to be so this is what the semantics is if you can't distinguish that uh, then how do i how can i play with 3000 versus 8500 the basic Note, you know, somewhere mention of 3,000 or 8,500 can't be described without going into this thing called semantics, right? Which may be captured in the precise description you give to, a, you know, whatever that type of data that is. Okay, so that's uh, you know rather early, you know, exposure that I had to semantics, and one of my early. In those days, I used to work on databases or heterogeneous distributed databases. So, in 1987, I gave my very first uh, tutorial on that topic, and I think that was the first tutorial ever offered anywhere uh, at in data engine conference. But um, and then we looked at variety of uh, you know data, and data integration was very big in those days. Um, there were companies like General Motors. Uh, and they would have a lot of databases, and um, and they still do. And their databases were created by different groups, um, and uh, so different people would create different schemas for their databases and then have their data. But when you build an application, you sometimes have to get data from this application and that application. And now imagine that uh, one application says cost. Of a meal, another application, uh, other sorry, the database, another database also says cost of the meal, but what if they meant totally differently, totally different, right? By each of those things, as I, the example I gave, then there is a problem, right? So what happened? That having just the, let's say, in, we were mostly talking about uh, in those days, uh, uh, so this thing predates probably your educational thing, but. Earlier, the very first data model for database was in a um, hierarchical data model, IMS. Uh, it's, uh, old IBM systems had, you know, mainframe systems had database system, and it was called IMS. Then came a something called network model. And then came uh, this so-called relational data model, which is still widely used. So, um, 
when you are relational database, you have a database schema and then you have the values. Right? Data description language and data definition language and that kind of stuff. A data query language. Now, uh, uh, the, that thing by itself did not have any place to describe semantics. So as you started thinking about multiple developing applications or doing queries across multiple databases, we had to do something more which is where the role of semantics came in. Right? Okay. And that led to um, you know, this paper in, uh, that I had in 1992. So far, yet so near. So far schematically, yet so near semantically. So the point is that things may be said very differently, but they are uh, you know, from the perspective of meaning and use and application, very similar. Could be also the way around. And so there we describe this concept of semantic proximity. Right? And I think that that um, uh, notion is still very, very uh, uh, valuable, uh, even though so many people have reinvented uh, you know, the work that has been done, uh, in that you have to recognize that um, when a particular database is defined and created, or a date, not even database, just data is created. It's created, it creators have a world view, mm. have a mental view, they make, they make some assumptions. Mm. Only a small fraction of that get captured in a database schema. Because ultimately, what is the role of schema? The role of schema is not to give the meaning to the data. The role of schema is simply to describe the organization of the data the structure of the data on the database, right? And that was created for the sake of efficient manipulation of data. And it was created for the uh, benefit of computing, right? I mean, earlier days, we didn't, we, 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 the machine power was at premium. Well, you know, machines were much more expensive than they are today, computing power. We used to learn in our in our courses uh, a lot more on a spa a space and time uh, trade-off, memory and time trade-off, than perhaps you do now, because memory is not as at premium, you know that. Right? So when I program on IBM uh, um, 11:30 and then IBM 360 and PDB 11:70, we are talking about kilobytes of memory, right? And um, and then. It might, the whole thing might have just a megabyte of memory or so, right? We're talking about that kind of stuff. Now, of course, you know, gigabyte and terabytes are common. And, and in fact, uh, you, know, you know, right? I mean, uh, any of the smartphones today are more powerful than any of the machines that I mentioned. So, um, uh, a lot would be kept outside of what is available to machine, which is the schema and the data. And that will be in the uh, mind of its developers or in the minds of the users who write application programs um, uh, to use the data or databases. That means semantics would be implicitly captured in the programs and encryption and capture into the code. Not made explicit. Which made it for very difficult which made for a very difficult challenge for data integration. Right? Because reading somebody's code to me to figure out what that data means is very hard. And you would have to read the code to see whether the person has used the interpretation for that cost of menu item as 3,000 or 8,500 equivalent. It won't be explicitly described. If you're very lucky, it will be described in the comment line. Right? So the whole point here is to, to support semantics. Obviously, you need to have some sort of explicit representation independent of the data. Um, then in um, 1993, uh, we started this project called InfoHarness. 
and we have paper in 1994 World Wide Web. Conference paper. This is the first, uh, second World Wide Web conference. Uh, you know, this, this is the most prestigious conference now. Um, there, we talked about um, this information analysis uh, system where um, we talked about um, having looking at different type of data, different formats of data. So you know, um, uh, there are many various formats uh, under which the data would be exchange among systems uh, for we are talking about news articles, we are talking about emails, we are talking about uh, web page and then we said well, okay we will do metadata annotate, we do annotation of data which is metadata and that we would um, uh, in, we call that information object and then we created a browser based search engine which is info harness, uh, where uh, we implemented what was what is called faceted search, or attribute search, or property search, any one of the things. So you have an object, let's say a news item. Then news item would have a title, would have the name of the journalist, would have date, would be reporting location, and then the text, and then copyright statement and all that kind of stuff. Right, the different piece of this. So. By analyzing different parts of it, you extract different things. We we'll say, you know, there this news item mentions um, uh, George S. W. Bush, mm. or that the title is this text, or that the date is this date. So these are all property and their values, or attribute their values, or facets, and then we would have. A search box that will allow you to, um, for a property, give any value, you know, and then the search engine is using the index over those extracted metadata to come up with the search results. Uh, well, now we are talking about. Do you know last time I was we were going through the history of web, and that the prototype for the web, worldwide web, was uh, started to be uh, developed in the end of, towards the end of 2000. The architecture was sketched by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 mm -hmm. at CERN. And then, um, so it was very early days, you know, internet was not that, it was there, but not that widespread. So clearly, um, the amount of, um, uh, uh, you know, the, how fast the information, the information did not spread that fast as it would be today. So very few people would have uh, uh, you know, uh, awareness of web and access to web. In that, those days, the, the very first, uh, uh, you know, arch the architecture had a uh, web server and very limited thing about displaying on the, on, on a screen, which then led to the first so-called so browser. But that browser was not very useful. The one that Tim Berners-Lee was working on, that's not very useful. What, be, what the first browser that became very useful was Mozilla, which itself, I think, if I remember correctly, came in 1993. Mozilla, I know, which is from Netscape. Right. Now, um, so, 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 uh, in, in, you know, what was the reason why the web, what, what was the motivation for web? Do you remember? Or initial, why did, Tim Berners-Lee and you know uh, why was he why was he able to uh, propose a some sort of computer science work some computing work uh, to an organization in high energy physics to transfer those physics data from one person information would be shared across right so what happened is that um, when you run these experiments, you generate the data and you want to share with the other scientists, right? Mm -hmm. And be before the web was there, mm -hmm. you will have to transfer it as a file. Mm -hmm. When you transfer this file, the rendering that I, I create data and the way I looked at in render is very different than yes. when you receive, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
and, and I don't think that in those days we had even Excel as a common format. Say, so, yeah, I'll send you Excel and you can open up with Excel and see the exact same thing. I think that was not there either. I might be rendering in a different schema and the other person will be rendering in a different schema. Yeah, so it will be harder to uh, share the data and, you know, um, so the uh, idea was that, um, hey, we want to be able to share the data that's generated and that uh, once I put up the data on server, one well, web server, everybody can render it and you know see it similarly. And I don't have to transfer the file. You have a um, address, which is URL, and you use that to um, uh, you know uh, display it, and it looks should look similar, right? Mm -hmm. And then came very early form of tabular formatting of the data and things of that nature came, right? So. Um, you know, you had H1, uh, the header, and tags. S2 tags, H2 and those kind of stuff, and then you create everything. Now, um, that earlier browser was not there, but the Mozilla came, you know, started to become uh, reasonably useful, and um, that's what we used in 1993 with our first prototype. In 1995, we already had a commercial product from this. Okay, uh, and that's pretty. Uh, proud moment that we actually were part of that. Uh, what happened was interestingly, and this is I'm going beyond the science and I'm talking a little bit of business here. Um, as you know, I have a little bit of a, a exposure to business and startups. Um, I went to, I told Belcourt that this info harness thing that we are developing is very valuable and it can be a very big market for you know, this could be very important Belcore, a product for Belcore. We can make a lot of money, basically. Businesses are there to, you know, sell products and services and make money. And so, um, we had uh, some MBA types, uh, you know, so-called business development officers. So they came and, uh, you know, this, they wanted us to explain why Belcore should care. Belcore, by the way, was a company that served telecommunications industry. They were, they, so the point, the short story is that they didn't know what the heck is internet. They didn't have any idea the internet would be very big. Now in 1995, internet was not, sorry, not, I didn't mean internet, web. In 1995, web was not that big. But some of us really thought it would be extremely big. Because we were using it because we saw the power, uh, we saw the value. So this they insisted that we do not make it as an internet product and they did not want to sell it to quote unquote developing internet market mm -hmm. they insist on uh, making the product and customize it for the their existing telecom no. client use yeah. so they use this for trouble ticket yeah. uh, you know uh, fixing and that kind of stuff as opposed to a general web search engine which is what info harness was a meta database uh, general web search engine which was well ahead of the search engines of another five seven eight year, uh, five seven years later meaning late 90s is was the start of the real large scale web engines right excite um, lycos um, uh, then altavista and then google Yahoo also came in the search a bit later on, right? So um, we are way ahead of the time, and uh, uh, there were uh, the two other products that were interesting at that time. Verity was a company that was that had, I think, such similar idea. And the guy uh, I know who was associated with Verity is uh, Prabhakar, uh, who is uh, now at Google. Um, um, uh, and uh, um, he was, I think, at Microsoft. Uh, but I just spent, you know, a few days with him at uh, one of the meetings we had uh, in Ireland. Um, and then um, uh, there's another company called Excalibur. I believe Infoharness was a uh, first among all those three, also. Another interesting thing happened is that in 1993, we wrote a paper, a technical report at Rutgers, and I had a student, um, his name is uh, Vipul Kashyap, who ended up being my very first PhD advisee. Um, 
So Vipul worked with me in uh, developing a uh, federated architecture for heterogeneous search uh, for for querying heterogeneous multiple data sources on the web, multiple heterogeneous data sources on the web, and we call that semantic information brokering architecture. Okay, uh, you know, and and in my my um, I even had a paragraph um, about uh, saying that one of the data sources can be a web page, you know, source. Web, it can be web pages or it can be databases accessible through internet. Okay. And in that we have in a, uh, in, uh, a um, let's see if I can uh, um, pull up uh, okay I don't have um, in this one so the, there is a paper in 1994 CIKM uh, and it is uh, federated ontologies based architecture, meaning multiple ontologies. And the idea was that you have um, um, different data sources described using one, you know, schema and ontology. And uh, so you have clearly multiple ontologies because different sources will be described using them. And then uh, a consumer or user, one who formulates the query, would have his own ontology. And so basically the idea was to be able to have uh, multiple different ontologies and being able to map things across ontologies. So today, uh, still there is one area uh, in semantic web which is uh, pretty popular called ontology alignment. So obviously we had to do that. Another paper, another work at that time, which um, has sort of, um, and this seems was uh, a uh, thing that done at ISI, which used one ontology for ontology based search and then uh, multiple ontology based search so Aradni and Observer, Observer was the project that we started uh, at my University of Georgia lab which is first uh, project for multi ontology query processing okay so you give me a query in one like uh, one uh, describe in one ontology I'll create sub queries describe on different ontologies and execute against different data sources get the results back and interpret back to you. Uh, Shu was uh, uh, one of the best known uh, early semantic web work uh, that I think was um, uh, Jeff Heflin and uh, 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 um, uh, Jim Handler. Right, so, and then I had a um, uh, very interesting um, thing called MREF. Um, you guys all know about HRF, right? So I said, well, HRF, what happens in HRF? HRF is right, like you have, um, let's say this is a web page, and then I would uh, write, you know, a link. Here is a link, right? Semantic information brokering link mm -hmm. is there, right? Yes. Now, uh, that link um, would take me to another web page. Mm -hmm. So, this is basically simply hypertext. Link, right? It doesn't have any other uh, promise that it is um, means anything else except for the following: that if I want, I can say that whatever it is has something to do with this text wow. in semantic information brokering. That was I can say nothing more, right? But it can be a lot more. Frankly, when you go to that particular you know, page, let's suppose I click on that, right? Where is it taking? Hmm. What happened with this guy? I guess it didn't work with full screen. Hmm? I guess you have to go out from the full screen. Hmm. Yeah, but it's not. <laughs> oh, cannot locate internet server or proxy, that's why, okay, maybe now it will. Why, why would it not locate internet server and proxy? Ah, okay, I know. Okay, so, Then 
there you go. Uh, it comes up with this. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the 1993 thing that I was ta talking to you about, right? Yes. Semantic based information brokering is a step towards realizing the infocosm. Um, this is a term that I, um, uh, you know, coined and uh, also named my first company by that name. Um, and it was a, um, there was a popular um, economic writer, uh, his name uh, was and maybe he's uh, George Gilder. And he uh, uh, had uh, coined the term telecosm because that is the time when a mobile phone was starting to be available. And that's the time that you can imagine that you can be on a beach and be able to receive call. Right? That's, you know, those are times. And so, um, but, but the whole idea was simply to be able to do voice and data, that's all, mm -hmm. wherever you are, being able to have access to voice and data anywhere. And my twist of that was, but I said, associate meaning with that. And so, it, I, instead of tele or data, I said information, right? So there was this uh, thing, let's look at this paper, and let me show you just one piece of the thing here. So this is the um, technical report which became a paper in a uh, uh, CIKM conference. But let me show you this architecture we developed that those days. Architecture of information consumers and information providers. And then you can see here, saying that for a consumer you can find uh, different pieces or uh, different sources where there may be data of interest which can give you the information you want and that you know each of the different sources may be described you know better with these different ontologies and so again this was 1993 and there's uh, this, this kind of brokering concept and all that now one of these can also be a web thing Okay, the information system can be worldwide web, or it can be something else that is a uh, in a, a data node. Uh, remember, um, these are the time where people are thinking of putting the databases, uh, like relational database, uh, on the web. And I don't think dynamic pages were still uh, uh, prevalent because this is still the static web time. You're not even dynamic web pages time. But one of them can be, um, you know, this. Um, um, let me see. So, um, um, if indeed uh, one of these can be, um, and then I discuss the query processing framework and all that, um, then a lot of things that happen after the coin of word semantic web which were very similar to this right so but you know as I, I mentioned last time I think the word um, semantic web is far more um, uh, I think uh, convey, you know, much better term than say semantic information brokering okay now um, So we discussed, uh, you know, uh, the use of our semantic web uh, in 1999, and I think team was also after not just the words, but what what is the meaning of those words? How people, you know, can have common interpretation. Now in that same, so this was coined there, but uh, I had already founded a company in 1999, my, you know, which was called Tali. We started to create. Uh, we, a commercial product and we already had commercial products mm -hmm. by um, uh, you know in 2000 so for example here is my um, talk semantic web and information brokering opportunities commercialization and challenges this was given in year 2000 okay and you know it takes some time from idea like this is what I'll call semantic web to actually do products so think about it we are actually already working on those things so, um, by the way, this is uh, meaning or relationship uh, 
of meaning or relating to meaning in Webster. Formal, you know, the definition of semantics. Meaning and use of data as an information system. This is what I have been using. Um, and then this is interesting. So this is what um, Tim say wrote. Imagine what computers can understand when there is a vast tangle of interconnected terms and data that can automatically be followed. This is that seems to be what that seems to have driven his vision for semantic web in that point of time. And you can see that that's valuable. That's though semantic web is a uh, bit more than that now. Um, and then there are a variety of uh, definitions of the semantic web that I had seen. Again, this is all unchanged from year 2000. So my definition was a concept that web accessible content can be organized semantically rather than through syntactic and structural methods. And then I, uh, uh, you know, was talking about work. Uh, there's a company called Oingo that had taxonomy. And Tali, this is my company. And uh, our research project on digital earth, uh, which uh, supported complex relationships. And then this is recognized recognition um, that um, this uh, DARPA uh, started project. You know, and Jim Handler was the program manager for that. Uh, um, they created this diamond language uh, called agent markup language, um, a DARPA agent markup language. And um, that and another language called OIL became the basis of defining the so called mm -hmm. OWL language. So this is uh, a description of um, Daml, and uh, I won't discuss too much here. But you can see there is a title is a something, in. and then uh, this was the um, vision of semantic web, which, by the way, uh, I think also significantly influenced um, that uh, well-known 2001 paper on in Scientific American. And so an agent basically would uh, be able to better understand the content and hence make uh, you know, more intelligent application. In the application would be to um, you know, like do uh, travel reservation for a consumer. Now, um, I would let me not. Uh, so, the, so, so the point was that, OK, there were such engines on those days. And uh, this is an attempt to show that uh, the search by itself, I am talking about traditional search engines earlier, before the recent semantic search work. Whether the, there, it was only the keyword, right? The search engine only understood the keyword. And um, they would, what, what, what would they do? They basically, there's a crawler that pulls up the page and then indexes all the words. And then it will do things like TFIDF or other things, information retrieval techniques, it will, um, um, now, in that context, let me make an interesting side remark. So this that was search, and this is a you know search indexing the pages is what was done by Excite and Alta Vista and many other places. And there's some differences, but more or less they were all similar. And Google did something radical. Right? What was that radical thing? Entities and uh, things. They look for not things and I'm, not no, just I'm talking about original Google thing, no, not page now. Rank. Page rank. Page rank, page rank yeah. yeah. And what is so interesting about page rank? That you evaluate the connection between the information. Like and what is so interesting about though that? Yeah, the trust. Page. Sorry, the trust. If it is coming from a well known publisher like Medpub, it is more trustful than the links is coming. And from. who gave that? Uh, you know, who gave, uh, gave that? The users. Users. Uh, content creators. If I, Mostly if I am the, uh, uh, if I am creating this web page, and then I am, um, for some term, or concept, I am linking to this website or web page. I am saying yeah. that I trust. I, you know, uh, yeah, I trust. trust that website. Trust or and, and, and that that is valuable information with regards to this. Yes. So you have taken a social, you know. Uh, uh, intelligence, yeah. you know, you've taken mm -hmm. my knowledge of 
that thing. And then if you rank me high enough, mm -hmm. then you can take or you can do whatever wherever you rank me, mm -hmm. you associate that much weight to my this linking to that. Right? Of yeah. course, I will be ranked higher only if a lot of other people Yeah. Keep pointing. Right? So it's suppose there are here is what happens, right? Suppose there are thousand Amit share. But most of the link for Amit share comes to my home page, then this yeah. is the one that gets, you know, uh, yes. higher up, right? Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Well, the fundamental thing here is that it exploited this collective wisdom. Yes. Social intelligence. Right? And this is an important principle for those of you who are going to do research in this area. Why exploit? You know, wh how do you figure out a way? So that's why the crowdsourcing and visible crowd and uh, collective intelligence, these are why very important terms and very important you know, techniques. Uh, this is why um, um, uh, the CMU guy, um, you know, uh, became very famous uh, for the CAPTCHA and uh, uh, Luis uh, Juan, you know, Juan, and uh, whereby he, you know, annotating the or identifying these two images Thing, right? The image recognition system that he built was extremely popular because he utilizes uh, every, millions of people's effort in getting uh -huh. something done. Okay? So, are you talking about the last uh, big data challenge? The one? No, no, the, 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 you know, this guy, uh, Luis, uh, uh, he came up with this thing about uh, two people tagging the you know, image the same, then. Yeah, because. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then, um, I put in terms of semantic search systems. I'm talking about of two year 2000. You know those times 1990s very low, and then I put directory. Now in those days, what did directory look like? Let me show you. This, this is how directory looked like. Right. So um, <clears throat> you have basically, uh, and, and and this is just showing you two levels, right? It's just showing you. Uh, arts and within arts, da, 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 right? Okay. But in this case, there are um, three. So, if you go and the, this may have further subcategories. Yeah. So there are totally the day on which I did the capture was three hundred seventeen thousand uh, categories. Yeah. What what was the idea here? The idea here is that when you click on that and went down to the leaflet level, then there will be simply a catalog of sites. So for example, if here there is a research center, and then they will say research center on semantic web or web 3.0, then there will be somebody would have manually put noises, link to noises here, noises and link to noises. This is what Yahoo did in the second part of 1990s. Okay, so they had um, uh, uh, the world's first person with the uh, job title ontology, ontologist. Srinija was her name. She was the person in charge of what is this structure? Mm. Ontology. Uh, what should be the ontology? And then they had 9,000 people working every day, cataloging and maintaining this uh, Yahoo's version of this thing. And that uh, each um, person would typically take care of 50 pages a day. Now, 9,000 times 50 is what? 450,000? Something like that, right? Unfortunately, what happened is that a lot more pages got created in a day than 450,000. Right? So, um, library became. Uh, now, the point though is that I have put dictionary, dictionary higher because this has more semantics. In that, at least I know that the content I'm going to belongs to this category of thing. So there's a little more semantics there in that sense. There is another problem in that. Hmm. that a, a site can belong to more than one category. Yes, yes, that, that, there are a lot of problems. So the pages are not just. Uh, they are more, more than what they are actually created. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there are a lot of problems. And uh, uh, also, uh, 
you and I may come with different decision to put them where. I mean, so that's that. and that actually it was done and that was accepted. Or, you know, that is a byproduct of this. And then I said, look, semantics is more meaning with context, or is what was the thing that I used. So semantics results in deep understanding of content, allowing highly relevant, fresh results, better personalization, and exceptional targeting. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, this is what Tali's thing looked like. Uh, we had um, uh, categorization, cat cataloging. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, So you can see how the content, and by the way, world model is knowledge, knowledge graph or, or ontology. In fact, this is a part of the first patent ever granted on semantic web. That was patent filed by us, uh, Tali. And um, <coughs> um, uh, we had extractor agents and then uh, you know, metabase and so on and so forth. And then it shows you, for example, you do a query <coughs> um, for um, Roger Clemens, or uh, you know, he was a guy playing for Yankee, uh, and um, then it will give you a video for this thing. It'll, these are all the metadata automatically extracted. And these are all the link automatically created to the relevant websites. For uh, Raj, I won't go into a lot of details here. There's a lot more, and we can just take out. But here is the semantic search of year 2000. But isn't this, isn't this like more of a mashup? Like uh, this, this, this can be said as a mashup. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, in that sense, so this is a rich media object, uh, and this is our equivalent of what is today the information block that box that Google has, and this is far richer than what you see today, because information on this is a mashup, as you said. It comes from multiple sources, not single source, yep. and a lot of metadata use is used, not just sort of links that somebody has given in Wikipedia. So here, I could say. You know, Moderna, for example, um, she, uh, this Moderna, this person Moderna here, you see, she's both a musician as well as artist. She has a, she, she, she was an actor, uh, she was the lead actress um, in the uh, movie called Avita. Right? So, this, this, is the, this is called, by the way, facet research. So, the facet in music, uh, in, in the domain of music, there are these facets, song, artist, album, other system. Mm -hmm. But in the domain of, um, let's say, um, um, uh, movie, you'll have actor and uh, production and uh, genre and whatever. Mm -hmm. Of course, music, music can also have genre. Right? And then, doing that, I know, when you do this, I know that you're looking for music as in, uh, Madonna as in musician, and not Madonna as in artist, uh, movie artist. And hence, my results will be, uh, I will first do only the uh, Moderna in the music context. Then I'll come up with Moderna in the artist context. And then when you click on one of them, I'll come up with this rich media reference object or mashup, or semantic mashup actually. Um, and, and, and this is the uh, search of year 2000, uh, you know, 1999-2000. And these were screenshots at the time I gave the talk in year 2000. We also had a directory, semantic directory system. So this is very interesting. What happens here is that you have the taxonomy, uh, also a directory like uh, other older directory, but you also have uh, a model whereby you, you can do search at any level. That will search only the subtree from that part. And uh, so here I look for, let's say, uh, suppose I type dual, 
then it will come back and say, do you mean David Dual or Patrick Dual? Uh. Where David Dual is in, um, you know, uh, uh, golf, but Patrick Dual is in movie, movie, okay? So it will help you disambiguate. It knows that it could be this or that, and if you tell which one it is, then it can give you much better results. Other than other, rather than making assumption, they could be either of them and giving you results from both of them or just either of them. And here, because it's golf, because you type David Dual, it already knows that this is golf. So it applies golf uh, model, domain model, or ontology component of the ontology. And then you say, oh, attributes of golf, or facets of golf are location, whether to man, tournament is playing, tournament name, course name, and players. Now players is already here, he's already a player here, so players is already not uh, linked. And then these players is already shown, say, top five players. And then players with all the names, and here looking for uh, uh, David Dual as players in golf, and you can see uh, all the results for that. And the side here, related side from which source, good source of golf related data can be obtained. Automatically generated. This page is where not manually created. Now here I say drop a dual. So no, not petty dual, drop a dual. In that case, system knows you are talking about films. So it has, and so you can see cast are these possible class and genre and all that stuff. And these are all the sites for film related things. High quality. And now when I go down, uh, you know, I choose, uh, you know, let's say uh, Tiger Wood in a swimming golf, I have all kinds of information. This is all explicitly thing related to Tiger uh, Woods. Uh, all the locations where he has played, all the tournaments he has played, all the course name he has played recently, all the players here that have been part of the same tournament that he is part of, and various video clicks that we have already crawled. And this is also dynamic? Yeah. Like if you put another name, it's going to give you different categories, different... Yes, totally dynamic, because uh, these are all dynamically generated pages, it looks up the schema and creates the pages along that way. So, because, uh, dynamic, you know, in the golf, uh, is a uh, you know in the ontology in the golf these, culture, these are going to be the attributes. Yeah. So there are all the things what we can do uh, later on and so on and so forth. Okay, so and then there is this the pat this is the pattern that was awarded in uh, year two thousand. So that was the title. So it was filed, by the way, in March 2000, you know, it was declared March 2000. And now, important thing to note, most of the people, when they uh, say semantic web, they would um, um, uh, refer to the Scientific American article. Pernesley, uh, Handler, and uh, Lasilla. That article had not come out yet. It came in May 2001, 2001, May. This was filed... 14 months before. Yeah. So, in fact, that article was not written when this was filed. And the interesting thing, and I, I, I can claim this with uh, pride, that if you look at that best-selling article, which has the vision of AI, ai you know, uh, agent-centric thing, that is still not reality, but what I say here is real reality. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll discuss in some other talk how the general thing about um, uh, semantic search is, is in here is a lot closer to Google semantic search introduced in 2013 mm -hmm. than anything the 2001 article from Bernersley uh, say. Now this article is well worth reading for uh, reading not for all of you. This is just too much information here, but um, at least some PhD students may want to skim through that, get a sense of it. There are um, um, 
there probably is interesting thing, right? Okay, so this is the well-known architect, uh, uh, architecture in 2000 that appeared in I think May 2001, and then uh, first five years uh, was mostly taken up by people who worked on this uh, Daml and uh, Owl and you know Oil and those kind of stuff, and they were largely AI people working on logic, description logic in particular, and then. Um, Starting mid 2000s, people started to take more practical use of semantic web, that kind of thing. So, just a question. So, since this technology is very old, like you're saying, early 2000s, mm. why, after like 13 years, an organization actually adapted this kind of technology? So, again, as we discussed the 2000 exchange between uh, Norwegian, uh, you know, uh, Norwegian response and my response, that was 2005. Mm -hmm. yeah. That Norwegian made the statement saying ontologies have no role in search. Yeah, so, so after that, eight, eight years it took them actually to, re to, uh, to realize that it is actually a, a great potential to use. Right. So, um, I think you might, who knows, right? I mean, I yeah. can't be uh, sure what is happening, you know, in, uh, in uh, Google, which is very smart people, right? Clearly, they are you know, one of the brightest people out there. Uh, and I won't claim that I'm smarter than them, but uh, I think it may be partly philosophical in the following way. That, uh, at least, uh, I mean, I knew um, the very first engineering director of Google I'm talking about um, in um, 2000 and early 2001, two or three. Uh, I uh, uh, I was a chair of um, IEEE metadata conference, and I invited uh, one of the Google's uh, Google's. I think he was Google's first engineering director. I could be wrong, but most likely he was first engineering director. His name is uh, Silver. Greg Silver, I believe. I can look it up, but uh, Scott so I had, um, I had, um, you know, known, you know, obviously you know people in, you know, Google and Yahoo. In fact, Mike, I, I gave demos of this thing to uh, the Yahoo's chief scientist, the Tali thing that I was showing you, mm -hmm. and a lot of other people, to X, uh, to Alta Vista, and all those other people. And um, they were just making the search work. So they really could not imagine semantic search. That's one thing. Second thing is that most of them had learned from the um, experience of why Yahoo directory, which was very human centric, which was supposed, which is supposedly an ontology, not nearly the ontology that I'm talking about or the Tali had, but it. I had a, a quote unquote an ontology, so that's a kind of directed structure of some form of ontology. So, in their mind, anything that is semantic was that kind of stuff, and that could did not scale. So, they were, um, so we are saying um, that, um, like, if you are uh, uh, burnt uh, drinking hot coffee or hot tea, you will. Uh, you know, try to cool down the milk that is not hot at all, hot at all right? So meaning, you know, you are you will be shy um, um, uh, if you are burnt once, even though you know unnecessarily so. But you know, this this uh, you know triggers a great uh, I mean subject. Like for example, this organization may actually wait for standardization from some, like for example, W3C. They wait for them actually to to like uh, come with the initiative that like for example the semantic web until they actually adapt such movements so so which is very sad i mean no that is that's that, that's a good point very good point and let me let me elaborate a little bit more on that though so they saw all these people saw web growing too fast and so scale was very very important Yahoo directory structure, and then another, there was another thing called um, mm, LookSmart, which had indexed 2 million pages. Both of them could not scale. So they said anything that involves human in the process for finding the content 
is not a good topic, not area, right? That is the premise on which yeah, Google got started. So, so that's a fun, you know, that's um, a winning thing. And it was winning with that, with that attitude, uh, with that, you know, understanding, and the fact that they came up with this very smart strategy called page rank, where indirectly, that is not an explicit semantics, but there is an implicit form of that, that they already had, they had, they had some level of smart vis-a-vis -vis other search engine. They were not dumb search engine purely based on IR. They had some level of smarts, and hence, it's not like they were totally devoid of them. See, if they only followed the path of uh, Luxma, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, Lyco search engine and Excite and address search engine, then they would not have been able to break out. Mm. Because of that, they first of all a scale, and b the results were fairly good. When it's fairly good, who is to say is is better than anybody else? What is your incentive to change? And what does it mean to be best? It's very hard. Because if you look at search engine, there is no standard. There is no gold standard to say what is 100% accuracy. None, nothing. This is not there, right? It's such a scale, you can't be too sure. You give a search term and say, here are the results. Is there any? No. Only thing is a human perception that a useful result show up as first, second, third, or in the first page. Human, you know, consumers, users are are very um, um, uh, they, 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 they don't want to put in any effort. They're right? impatient. They, yeah, they're impatient. They don't want to put in any effort. They simply want to have immediately some results and have immediate gratification of having gotten something yeah. that they can potentially use or like to use. Yeah, one click, one look. Right. So, Google, without many more semantics other than this indirect form of page rank, was already able to get very good links on the first three, four, five, you know, first pages. And it scaled. Yeah. And another very important thing. What is the what is the business case for Google? Selling ads. Selling ads. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens? Do we, does it matter what the search results are? Mm -hmm. It matters in the sense that if they are good, more people will use it. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it doesn't matter. It matters that people click on his ads. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, that's one thing. Second thing was, so I think this one aspect, the second thing was that they did not, and that comes down to the point you are trying to make. Not just a transition, but simply they did not see the to, uh, uh, development of a semantic solution at scale. Mm -hmm. If you look at, so we should carefully study Norvig's uh, post. And he assumes that um, uh, a semantic solution, in particular creation of ontology, is human intensive. And only ontologies were created, created by humans. And he may not have seen my pattern and how Tali worked. We did not use humans to um, you know, maintain our ontologies or grow our ontologies. We did not. Just as um, after, high, after buying Freebase, uh, MetaWeb, uh, they did not either. So we had already pioneered a way to do that, but they had not seen that. And they, or whosoever were decision making perhaps did not figure out until much later, like you know, in whatever, uh, closer to 2013, that, oh, it can be done automatically. In that case, uh, one possibility is that they notice that uh, Wikipedia is a great place anyway. From that, we can, and we can create a lot of knowledge. Freebase is there. Uh, look, this guy's created. We could acquire Freebase for very affordable sum for Google. And indeed, having all those entities in the Freebase and relationship can improve our search results. So they saw that. Somebody invested time and money to create Freebase 
that they could acquire for a few million dollars, few only. I think I, I, I had heard of the number. I think they, they bought it for one point some billion. Nah, no, 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 not, not made up. No, no. no? It was probably the cost of acquiring the five or ten employees they had. So, um, so they got it cheaply. Uh, by that time, they were convinced that they can be automatically maintained. Okay, and they said, "Oh, this." And by then, so many papers were written on the use of Wikipedia already mm -hmm. that that it was not a brainer. Before that, they were not sure. While I will show you when we go through the paper from Dali, the 2002 paper on managing content on the web. When you go through that paper, you will see that discussed in detail. So I will show you uh, my own pictures from those days um, of how we created it and how it was created. I only had one and a half employees to maintain all my 25 domains and ontologies. How was the half? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and, and those employees uh, were not computer scientists. Yeah. I had one of them was music major. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you don't have to pay much to music major. I didn't pay the minimum wage. <laughs> so, um, all right, so that brings us to this uh, post. Let's see what. Woo! So, uh, all right, we pick up the Can you just stop there? Time flies. Yeah, time flies.